Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to C4C Apologetics. You know who I am, and most of you probably know who this guy is as well, sitting on, well, I would say sitting in front of me because uh, he actually is my camp computer, but he's actually sitting on my right. I, Nope. You're, yeah, you're on my right. So I'm looking at you. Hi, hi, Paul. How are you? <laughs> oh, no, I've never done that before. But with us today is Dr. Paul Miles. He's got a demon from Tyndale Theological Seminary. He's one of the founding members of the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics. And yes, that is a mouthful. And he's also the host of the <laughs> Thursday show podcast show. You can find it on various platforms. And today, what me and Dr. Miles are going to be talking about is this aspect of creationism evolution and uh, what the scripture says. So we're going to be looking at various theories. We're going to be looking at uh, some some tough questions people have and really try to come at it from a biblical perspective and uh, give us re give you guys reasons why we believe what we believe from a biblical perspective. But before we get into that, uh, Paul, just thank you for being with us today. Could you share a little bit about yourself, any ministries, anything you want to share with the people to know a little bit about <laughs> you? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you so much for having me here, by the way. It's uh, it's a real uh, privilege. So I'm uh, Paul Miles. Uh, I am the uh, executive director of Grace Abroad Ministries, which is a small ministry that my wife and I set up. I immigrated to Ukraine mm. back in 2011, and uh, that's where my wife and I uh, met, fell in love, got married, all that mushy stuff. And we <laughs> saw a uh, real need out there for theologically sound uh, materials in Russian and Ukrainian. So we started a translation ministry that grew into a teaching and outreach ministry as well, Grace Abroad. We are uh, currently displaced in Oklahoma due to current events out there. So uh, yeah. yeah, we we started, uh, you mentioned the International Society for Biblical Hermeneutics. We started that back in 2020 with several other like-minded dispensationalists around mm -hmm. Europe. And uh, it's been a a real uh, a real pleasure to to be able to serve the Lord in defending <laughs> hermeneutics and the scriptures and the, the proper reading understanding thereof. It's like what what part of uh, Oklahoma are you holding up in right now? Winniewood. Winniewood is uh, about an hour south of Oklahoma yeah. City, right off of I thirty five. It became okay. very famous in twenty twenty because of the Netflix documentary Tiger King. Oh. which is about but a uh, tiger zoo that used to be here mm -hmm. and uh, everyone was locked in so mm -hmm. a lot of people watched it and oh interesting that that, that right. documentary is not representative at all of Winniewood <laughs> no. Winniewood is uh, not like uh, Joe Exotic uh, no. so. I know my wife he used to be around here. I used to see him all over the place it's it's so surreal coming from this small town environment and uh, right my wife grew up in Oklahoma, so she spent many okay. years there outside of uh, Oklahoma City, Newcastle Blanchard area. We used to live out there when I was stationed out at Tinker, and uh, my parents oh, were outside the Tulsa area. My grandfather's out there, so uh, if you need anything, give me a shout while you're there. But <laughs> as much as I want to talk about Native American history and Oklahoma history, that's not why we're here today. Oh, yes. So no, it's not. I, <laughs> well, in a, in, a, in a way, we are right. We're talking about well, global history, and uh, Oklahoma is on the globe, so uh, <laughs> yeah, it's related. You are totally right. In <laughs> in some way, we can tie in Native American history as well, right? Because they're a history oh, yes. people group, if you will. But uh, no, you're totally yeah. right. Being corrected, I appreciate that. I love you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but so what we're talking about, like I said today, is creationism. Various <laughs> questions that many people have. And then uh, one of them, as a spoiler, as a teaser, is we're going to be talking about the Ice Age here in a little bit, or he is. I don't understand a whole lot about that, so I'm just going to defer to one of uh, one of the people that have researched this in, in a quote-unquote expert in my eyes. And so we're going to get there. But first, before we even get into uh, that, Paul, could you explain, does it even really matter what one believes, whether they believe in a... 13 billion year old universe and a 4.6 billion year old earth or whether they believe in a six day literal creation does it does it matter what one believes this is a good question mm -hmm. and uh i, only I, I love to ones. follow up this question <laughs> oh yes <clears throat> whenever someone asks me does it matter 
Uh-huh. And uh, it doesn't matter what it is that they're asking about, right? Uh, is it uh, young earth creationism? Is it uh, free grace soteriology? Is mm-hmm. it uh, uh, dispensational eschatology? Whenever mm-hmm. the question is, does it matter? Mm-hmm. I like to uh, respond with, could you give me an example of something that does matter? Mm. Uh, so in in, uh, in this environment, I'm assuming that... Uh, uh, predominantly Christians might be watching this. So typically when I, when I'm talking with Christians, something that we will agree does matter mm-hmm. is salvation and the gospel, right? right? We might disagree on what the gospel is. We might disagree on the terms of salvation, but I think we can all agree that salvation does matter. Right. Uh, so is it possible then to tie creationism, young earth creationism, your view of the origins to the gospel. I think it's very easy to to make that connection. Okay. Now, in uh, in one sense, uh, it does not matter what you believe about Genesis one through eleven when mm-hmm. it comes to the question, "Are you saved?" Right? To be okay, saved, right. it's just a matter of believing in Jesus for eternal life. It's not about believing in a global flood. It's not about believing in a short creation. Right. Right. Um. So in that sense, you could argue it doesn't matter. However, what I'm finding is that uh, there's a distinction between salvation and discipleship. So we're okay. saved simply by believing in Christ, mm-hmm. but after that, we should carry on a a lifelong growth process of, of sanctification. Right. And I would say that it's very important to have a good understanding of Genesis 1 through 11 in that process. Mm. Um as we grow, we should be reaching out to other mm-hmm. people. And what I'm noticing is uh, my friends who uh, have gotten saved, they have believed in Christ, often uh, several of them have apostatized and completely abandoned Christianity. They're mm-hmm. still saved, right? right? Believe in Christ, he gives you eternal life. Eternal life is a current possession. It doesn't end just because you, you go weird on me. <laughs> said weird. I have friends that uh, <laughs> go weird. That's that's an, an idiom I've come up with. It's uh, an all inclusive for a lot of uh, bad things that are happening, right? I like so I, I see this happen. My my friends they they become believers and then they they go weird because they say, well, the Bible is wrong about origins, and then they they twist off. As a result, they are no longer evangelizing. They're no longer spreading the gospel. Okay. And because of that, there are people that could be hearing the gospel and getting saved that are not because someone had a bad idea mm. of Genesis. Or that's if you completely apostatize and go weird. There are other ways right. to go weird. Um, one way would be to say that the uh, the Bible um, does contain certain truths, but as we see in Genesis 1 through 11, it clearly has errant views of cosmology Mm -hmm. so we can't take seriously you know this notion of adam sinning we can't take seriously the notion of the fall we can't take seriously the notion of the um the curse that resulted um that carries over eventually to the questions of what happened at the cross um there is a particular view of the atonement called christus victor Okay. which would say that Christ died to fight Satan in this great cosmological battle against the curse. The curse is not a literal, actual event that happened. Mm. The thorns and everything we see around us are not actually a result of the curse. The curse is a spiritual experience, a spiritual realm. It's not physical as described in the Bible. Okay, And so the the cross was not about paying for sin. It's about this cosmological battle with evil mm. and establish the kingdom. So now instead of believing in Jesus for eternal life, it's not that we lack eternal life. It's that we need to build the kingdom through good works. Okay. That is a, a false gospel. Uh, when you, when you take that approach to the atonement, which is rooted in a false view of uh, Genesis, mm. you end up uh, not seeing Christ as dying for your act actual sin, but rather as uh, an establishment of a spiritual realm and a spiritual uh-huh. kingdom. You're not saved by faith. It's through works that you're building the kingdom. And uh, 
that is uh, that's that's going weird in a a particular special way that prevents people from hearing the gospel, right? So yeah, uh, so yeah, I think uh, evangelism does matter, and the the message of Genesis one through eleven matters for evangelism. So Genesis one through eleven matters. That's I could draw other examples, but we'll yeah, that's, be. that's that's actually fascinating because when when you pull up the aspect of the Christus Victor. Uh, if you will, and the role origins play in one's view of origins, and then mm-hmm. applying that atonement theory to the cross, you're right. It does bring in this concept of dualism between good and evil, if you will. And yep. I guess it would posit that uh, the universe was created exactly as we see it now with all this suffering and with all the curse and, and things like that. Oftentimes what I hear from people when you're talking about why does it even matter is they go that slippery slope, you know, argument in the fact, well, if you neglect to see literal Genesis one through 11, then you're picking and choosing what you believe is literal and what you believe is not. You're divorcing it from its genre, if you will. And then the things that Jesus says, where Jesus refers to Adam and Eve being created from the beginning. And, uh, and so and I appreciate your, your explanation on a different area that, you know, I've, probably never considered and i don't think i've ever heard on why genesis 1 through 11 matters it's funny because well i'm gonna see if you touch this part uh before i bring it up please excuse my cough by the way Uh, i was teaching genesis in hungary two weeks ago and i got a really bad cough i'm still coming over it sorry if i cough every now and then okay go on (laughs) you were what what does being hungry have to do with you teaching genesis Oh no, I was in Hungary, the the, the, the country. I'm just kidding. Yes. <laughs> it was like beautiful an old country, school. beautiful people. It's a wonderful place. But... It was like an old school. I'm sorry, joke. go on. I, I interrupted there. <laughs> no, you're fine. I was thinking like uh, Middle Eastern jokes. It's like I, Iraq was hungry, so I ran t- to get it some turkey. You know, you got all those Middle Eastern countries type deal. But uh, anyways, I oh, yeah. digress. I. I saw a shirt today that said it's not dad jokes. They're actually rad jokes. So anyways, let's see, I'm going to get Wait. off that rabbit trail. So Genesis 1 through right. 11. Uh, we're looking at creationism versus evolution, if you will. Could you explain what the various views? I don't want to call them theories because according to the scientific method, a theory has to be tested, observed, and repeatable. And uh, so many times when people argue for a theory scientifically, it is not a theory. They're merely just hypotheses. (laughs) And so could you explain what the different views are on how uh, the universe began, how, uh, uh, how everything came into existence? What are the different views? There are uh, several views, and then each view has several subcategories within. Mm -hmm. Um, We could uh, summarize them, though. Um, So one view, which is probably the most common that you're you're probably going to hear in your your local public school, is Mm -hmm. pure naturalism. Mm. That uh, entirely by chance, all of the matter that exists started Mm -hmm. to exist, and uh, through um, chance – Non-life became life, and through chance, non-intelligence became intelligence, and we somehow or another continue to get better and better and better until we are where we are today, mm. and we will continue to improve, improve, improve until um, the sun blows up or global warming gets us all. Right. Uh, this is the uh, the worldview that you're surrounded with, so I don't need to expound on it. Right. Then there is the theistic perspectives mm-hmm. naturalism says that uh matter is all that exists okay. uh, theistic perspectives would say that there is still god mm-hmm. within these views um from under the umbrella of christianity we right. have uh progressive creationism which would say that god created everything very slowly um mm-hmm. Some of these folks would uh, appeal to um, evolution, so they would take the naturalist view, which I think has very serious scientific problems, which are becoming more and more evident the more we know about creation. Right. And some people are trying to build a bridge and say, well, yes, there was indeed this process of evolution, like the naturalists are saying, but God somehow orchestrated it. Okay. Um. 
this is trying to find a middle ground with a view that I think is uh, very uh, aberrant. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the middle ground view itself, being a middle ground with an aberrant view, is is a little 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 goofy. Mm -hmm. Then there is uh, day age theory. Uh, day eight. I don't think I've ever heard of that one. Okay. So we look at the uh, the biblical text, and it describes a seven day uh, creation period. Uh, first six days have actual creation acts. The seventh day is a day of of rest, of stopping, mm -hmm. of uh, Sabbath. So some folks would say that the uh, the six days here are not twenty four hour periods, um, but rather long, extensive periods. Mm -hmm. And they would say this is the way that the word yom, which is Hebrew for day, occurs through the Bible. And it's true. The word yom can mean more than one day. The, the first uh, non-controversial yom in Genesis is a non-24-hour period because it talks about the day in which God created everything referring to the week. Okay, right. Of course, we have the eschatological day of the Lord, which is a reference to the seven-year tribulation period or mm -hmm. the thousand-year millennial kingdom or both. Okay. Um, however, I think if we look at the biblical text, uh, we'll see that the word yom, which means 24 hours in a lot of contexts as well. In fact, that's the uh, the usual use of the word. I think that it's the intention of the biblical author that this be understood as a 24-hour period in the creation week as well, mm -hmm. um, which would bring us to the young earth perspective is mm -hmm. uh, young earth creationist perspective, which would say that it was indeed six 24 hour periods followed by a seven 24 hour period followed by every 24 hour period since. <laughs> um, one of the defenses of this view is that whenever we um, go through the Hebrew text, it will say, and there was evening and there was morning day one, day right. two, day three, right? Yom Echad. Um, this use of numbers attached to day is only used in reference to 24-hour periods. Mm. We also have this, and there was evening and there was morning, uh, which is a, a reference to the completion of a 24-hour period. Mm -hmm. The, uh, or a result of this view is that we have a, uh, a universe that is young relative to the other views. Other views would say that the universe is billions of years old, and this uh, date keeps changing as the naturalist community decides to keep modifying their view because they keep finding problems with their view. Right. But we of the young Earth perspective would typically say <clears throat> that the, uh, the universe is between 6 and 10,000 years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I tend to think that uh, 6,000 is pretty old. So I like to jokingly call myself an old earth creationist because 6,000 <laughs> is pretty old. But I always have to clarify that because you want to be honest, right? And if you say old earth, people are thinking billions, right? I don't yeah. think like that. What, what about uh, – I've heard a lot of discussion about the gap theory. Okay. Uh, so the gap theory – sure. Gap theory can go with young earth creationism. Or it can go with one of the older Earth versions. Mm -hmm. um, I uh, would disagree with gap theory. Okay. Uh, but while I don't defend gap theory, I do defend gap theorists because we have a lot of really good gap theorists. However, we need to kind of clarify what a good gap theory is that mm -hmm. I would disagree with and what a bad gap theory is, which I would really disagree with. Yeah, yeah. So the gap theory – was actually born a couple hundred years before Darwin started coming up with his his business, right? Okay. Gap theory originally did not have anything to do with trying to extend the age of the universe. Mm -hmm. um, the original question that gap theory sought to answer was, when did the angelic fall occur? Sure. Right? Okay. So there was a theory that developed that said, okay, during the creation week, there was a gap within that period. Mm -hmm. And during this gap of time, this is when God created the angels. This is when Satan fell. This is when Satan took all the, the demons with them and, and they fell. And then the creation week continued. 
Mm. And uh, theoretically, you can insert this gap anywhere that you want. It's common to put this uh, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So we have, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, mm -hmm. and the earth was formless and void, uh, Genesis 1-2. This word was uh, can sometimes be translated as became. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they'll say that the, God created the heavens and the earth. He created everything in a nice orderly fashion. Then at the fall, the earth became formless and void. And then there's a recreation that occurs after that. Um, I don't think this is necessarily justified in the text. It's not necessary for mm -hmm. the angelic fall to have occurred uh, I think the angels could have been created on their own uh, process and they could have fallen uh, very easily at a very early date. Okay. Early enough to tempt Adam and Eve, right? Right. So it's sort of uh, you invented a problem and you resolved the problem yourself, but uh, it's not necessarily <laughs> uh, biblical. That view, however, I don't think is anti-biblical. This is not a view that says, well, the Bible is wrong, so we have to uh, correct it somehow. Or, mm -hmm. well, the atheist community is saying something contrary to the Bible, so we need to make the Bible more appealing to them. Mm. Gap theory, when it's trying to describe the angel, angelic conflict, is not doing that. So I consider gap theorists of that ilk to still be the good guys. <laughs> however, there's another gap theory. That yeah. starts with, well, the atheist community says that the earth is very, very, very old. Mm -hmm. So we need to find a way to make the earth very old in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So a way that people will do that is they'll insert gaps throughout the creation week to give us more time. Uh, this, I think, is not only biblically justified, but it is trying to insert a faulty worldview with faulty ideology into the Bible. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit more dangerous than trying to use it to explain the angelic fall. So mm -hmm. uh, that's the uh, the basics of gap theory. Does that kind of make sense? Did I explain that well? <laughs> no, it definitely does. And, and I like how you pointed out that while some gap theory advocates aren't necessarily against scripture, you know, it could be a very short gap that doesn't uh, contradict a literal, you know, 24 hour creation day. Others, on the other hand, are just trying to reconcile what they believe of science and uh, what they believe as from Scripture. And so I appreciate you articulating the fact that one hand it's bad, on the other hand it, it could be okay. Uh, I, I would personally reject gap theory myself as well, just from my own personal study and the fact of uh, we know in Job all the all the uh, stars you know shouted for joy when god was creating laying the foundation and then i can't see in genesis 131 where god looked at all his creation all that he has created and said it was very good now if we're looking at the the heavens and the earth and if we want to look at the heavens just as the universe and planet stars or if we want to look at everything within time space matter if you will i would argue god wouldn't say it was very good if the angelic rebellion happened, you know, and so there's arguments too, but, uh, and I'm with you, you know, I wouldn't say that the gap theory is, is accurate. I wouldn't agree with it. That being the case, there's a bad side and a okay side, you know, and I would be like you, yeah. okay side is, it's like Oklahoma. It's okay, if you will, but there you go. So you're clear in explaining the various views, if you will, but could you explain which view, and you alluded to it with young earth creationism, so why do you believe young earth creationism is the most biblical? What arguments do you have for it? So this is, uh, this is an, interesting, uh, an interesting topic for me. Mm -hmm. I actually became a, uh, a young earther at a time when I was not accepting the Bible. Hmm. So... Uh, Short testimony here. I was raised in church. I became a believer as a very young boy, but uh, the uh, environment that I was uh, brought up in, theologically speaking, was not very uh, uh, theologically robust. So mm -hmm. I, as well as most of the others in the youth group with me, completely apostatized by the time we were in our late teens. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I, I actually became a very outspoken critic of Christianity, an apologist oh, wow. against uh, Christianity. Hmm. But I had a, a friend in college that showed me some videos of a young earth creationist and he built a really good 
case that there were some serious problems with evolution mm-hmm. and that there are a lot of reasons to believe that the earth was a recent creation. Mm-hmm. So I actually accepted that. I rejected the notion of the cross. I rejected yeah. the notion of Jesus's virgin birth and everything that the, the Bible has to say about it. But I was like, he makes a good point from uh, scientific reasoning, just observing the universe around us, that indeed the earth is a recent creation. Mm-hmm. So I'm a, a bit of an oddball like that. Uh, <laughs> You're weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I had gone weird is what happened. and uh, But in my, my weird state, I was brought to uh, a more accurate view of our origins. And then later, um, studying the uh, the apologetics of the resurrection, that's what brought me to Christianity, brought me back to Christianity. So the reason I'm a young earther is actually because of, uh, chronologically speaking, it's because of the... Uh, uh, that which is observable around us. But that wasn't your question. The question, why why is it biblical to be well, a, a young earth creation? Why do you believe it? What arguments do you have for it? Yeah. So part of the um, the the discussion, I say part of the discussion, mm-hmm. a huge part of the discussion is the nature of the flood. Okay. Uh, I find that so frequently these discussions are, uh, we, we talk about, the young earth, but the the biggest issue here is actually the global flood. There's a there's a similar issue going on in other discussions. So mm-hmm. um, the mythological hermeneutics, uh, this is a form of uh, um, typically old earth uh, creationism that would say that the Bible is basically copying pagan myths around them and uh, – the biblical authors wanted to take the pagan myths and rearrange them to be monotheistic. So mm-hmm. the biblical um, cosmology is basically a flat earth with a firm sky around it. Right. Uh, people would take that mythological approach to scripture. A few years ago, there was a big movement of actual people, of the actual flat earth movement. You've probably heard of it. These are people accepting the mythological approach to scriptures and trying to make it literal. Mm-hmm. Well, that whole discussion isn't really about this, the flatness of the earth. It's about the sky, mm-hmm. right? Um, which there's a lot to uh, to be said about that. I've written about that elsewhere. So frequently, whenever we're talking about one thing, there's another issue at play that really takes center stage. Mm-hmm. So in that discussion, it's the sky. In this young earth discussion, it's the flood. Okay. The nature of the flood changes the way that the entire planet looks. Mm-hmm. Since we have a, a planet, since everything that we're looking at, everything we're touching around us is the is what's left after the entire earth was covered in water, mm-hmm. it fundamentally changes the way that we look at, at our planet. So all of a sudden, take the, uh, the Grand Canyon here mm-hmm. in America. Uh, rather than being formed out over the course of millions and millions of years through a little tiny tiny trickle of water, <laughs> it was actually formed very quickly as the waters subsided after the global flood, right? Mm-hmm. So now all of a sudden everything around us doesn't appear to be old. Rather, it appears to be the result of a big catastrophe with some slowed effects afterwards. Um so it's it's really the global flood and the biblical case and the scientific case for that that pushes me to a recent flood. Now, hmm. if we have a recent global flood, <laughs> we start there. Okay. Now we can back up and we can count how many uh, generations and everything. Mm-hmm. And there is some dispute, by the way, over uh, the nature of the the genealogies in Genesis. Some would say that there's that it's open that there are a couple of gaps here and there. Right, uh, which is fine. That can expand the uh, the time between the flood and the creation, a couple centuries, millennia at the most. Right, but then we can back a couple thousand years, and uh, we end up with a creation week that was uh, shortly before the flood. I say shortly, I mean like two thousand years, a little bit. More. Okay, so four thousand some odd years to the flood, another two thousand years back, boom, uh, six thousand years old with a little variance for accounting for um, uh, open genealogies as well as textual Mm -hmm. variants 
So what would you what would you say to those that if they were to subscribe to, you know, the flood in the carving of the Grand Canyon by the flood, that that doesn't necessarily uh, indicate a young earth. You know what I mean? Because it's an interesting concept that you brought up that one of your arguments for the young earth is is the flood and its carving of the Grand Canyon in uh, the aspect of catastrophism versus uniformitarianism. But why would you hold to that one? You know, sorry, I have to ask, you know, that one. Yeah. Uh, as please. far as a young earth. So could you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Well, sure. This is a good question, right? So assuming a, uh, a global flood 4,000 years ago mm -hmm. uh, destroyed everything on Earth, it fundamentally changed everything that we're looking at now. Mm -hmm. So uh, prior to the flood, we didn't have a Grand Canyon. We didn't have all of the uh, the dirt that we're able to see. It was all mixed up or okay. matched up at the, uh, at the flood. Mm -hmm. So this does raise the question then. Uh, could it be then that the Earth is actually bazillions of years old mm -hmm. leading up to the flood? And then the flood mixes everything up, and now everything that we have is the result of a, uh, right. a recent flood. Um, so from there, I'd probably back up and uh, go straight back to um, the creation week. And uh, as we discussed earlier, the mm -hmm. terminology for the, the creation week, having that, that uh, formula of then there was evening, then there was morning, day, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. That, I think, uh, justifies a week-long period there. Mm -hmm. Then the um, the genealogies following that. In the theory, people say that we could have some gaps in there, but I don't think it would be very uh, realistic to include huge gaps mm -hmm. after the creation week. Um, so the creation week, I think, is a... Uh, a, a uh, Seven twenty four seven seven twenty four hour period right. week, and we have that, that two thousand years or so of people filling the earth. Um, no gaps in the first one. I don't think we can really put big gaps here either. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know of anyone that's trying to put huge gaps there, other than the possibility of um, extended genealogies or holes in the genealogy. Right. Uh. The, the furthest I've seen extended in that period would be in the course of thousands of years. It, it still wouldn't really fit the millions. Hmm. So, okay. Unless there's a different argument that I'm not aware of, which yeah. there very well could be. So. <laughs> you mean you don't know all the arguments? <laughs> uh, you're a very knowledgeable guy. And Paul. if there isn't one today, there'll be one tomorrow. So <laughs> That is totally right. People are creating everything just to try to disprove yeah. or, or discount for God. But. No, I, I appreciate the clarification as far as the flood and, and what role that plays within a young earth. What What's fascinating to me is, you know, we might have some well-meaning Christians. And I like when you said it doesn't matter what you believe as far as how old the earth is, as far as the gospel plan of salvation is concerned, because salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone and Christ alone, not on your view on how old the earth is. Uh, that being said, yeah. for those Christians out there that are trying to reconcile what they believe is science and uh, with the Bible, when you go through Genesis 1, the evolutionary or the naturalistic order of events does not line up with the sequential order of events in Genesis chapter 1 as well. When you're looking at when the sun, moon, stars, planets were created, when you're looking at when uh, life forms were created, it doesn't match. And so for those well-meaning Christians out there trying to uh, put naturalism and the Bible's uh, Genesis chapter 1 together, y they don't line up. They're actually they don't. contradicting each other. And so you have to pick and choose which one we're following. What were you going to say, Paul? Day three, we get the creation of plants. Mm -hmm. Day four, we get the creation of the sun. Mm -hmm. So yep. if, if you're going to have uh, millions of years for, for day three with your, your plants, mm -hmm. are plants going to be able to survive that long without a sun, right? Right. I guess yep. God could have a, a local... Uh, a local light source. Um, but that, that day four of creation is particularly difficult, I think, for those that want to try to have a progressive creationism who try to say that there's a uh, evolutionary order. Yep. Uh, they'll often point to it. See, 
we have plants and then we have fish and then we have land animals. Mm -hmm. That's the order of evolution. I'm like, okay, that sounds good until you see that you have the celestial being, the, the celestial bodies being created in the middle of that. It doesn't work. Yep. So. And then when you look at chemical evolution and how they would argue every single uh, chemical element on the table, I believe, come from hydrogen. You know, how would that happen randomly over chance over billions of years from one element? But I mean, there's a lot to be said and I appreciate, <laughs> huh? Adapt. That's not going to happen. <laughs> no, no, it's not. I like what Kent Hovind says, you know, <laughs> where, where we posit God, the naturalist will posit a long time ago, you know? And so I like his argument there, but you, you somewhat alluded to it uh, moments ago. Second Peter chapter three, verse number five, Peter writes the fact that the earth uh, standing in the water and out of the water. Now, depending on what translation you read, it might write something a little differently. What are your views on uh, Second Peter chapter three, verse number five, with the earth standing in the water and out of the water? What do you believe Peter is talking about there? Good question. I'll uh, read Second Peter three. I'll start at four and go through six here. So, okay. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they will fully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, mm -hmm. by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. So there are uh, two uh, conservative approaches here from a, a young Earth perspective. One view would be the uh, reference to the Earth standing out of the water and in the water. Mm -hmm. So day one of creation, uh, God created the heavens and the Earth. I would say that he created all of the matter at that moment. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a big watery blob. The spirit, okay. of the, the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, see, mm -hmm. face of the deep. Um then God created light, which I think uh, implies a lot of uh, laws of physics and stuff going on there. Okay, yeah. Then day two, he creates a rakia, uh, mm -hmm. is the Hebrew word, which uh, some have translated as firmament. I think mm -hmm. that's an incorrect translation uh, <laughs> that comes from a uh, an attempt by the Septuagint translators to try to build that bridge between mm. the biblical worldview and the worldview of the people around them, okay. kind of like theistic evolutionists do today. That's where right. I think the firmament came in. Topic for another day. In reality, I <laughs> think that the word one. rakia means expanse. Uh -huh. So God created an expanse separating the waters from the water. Um, so on day two, you have this, you got this big bubbly blob of matter, and God expands <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> flings matter way the heck out there yeah right all over that way down this way this way that way right and you still have kind of a formless void earth and you have a bunch of matter out there <laughs> well then later on day four as we discussed uh he goes and he forms all that matter into stars and planets and all this beautiful stuff and, and the more the better our microscopes or our telescopes get, the better images we get of it all. It's a beautiful thing. That's that's the result of day four. Yeah. So there, there's so one thought here is that this reference to the earth standing out of the water and in the water could be a reference to that, right? Mm -hmm. Big water, throw the water out, and you still have the, the earth in the middle. That's that's okay. an okay view. I would tend to think that this is a reference to the global flood. Okay. Um some would say from the gap theory that this is a reference to uh, the earth becoming formless and void like we see in uh, okay. uh, first Genesis 1-2. Like I say, I think there are some uh, difficulties with that view, but they're, right. they're still the good guys, right? Um, so I would say that this is probably a reference to the global flood. And the reason I would say that is contextual, right? Peter is warning of these uh, scoffers. Um Right, verse three, knowing this first that scoffers mm -hmm. will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, mm -hmm. and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? Um we see that today, by the way. Right? Yeah. We're looking forward to uh the second coming of Christ. People are scoffing this idea. Well, I think that uh Peter is comparing what we're seeing today with people scoffing us 
to the way that people scoffed Noah back in his day. Right? Mm, okay. Uh, Noah is building this giant ark on land. That's a rather eccentric thing to do. I can only imagine how much he was <laughs> teased on the playground for that move. Yeah. Um, but as a result, um, the, the flood came. And in verse 6, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with uh, with water. So mm-hmm. it's uh, talking about how there were scoffers then. They were all destroyed with water. Likewise, there are scoffers now who will be destroyed in the uh, the coming tribulation mm-hmm. and judgments to come. Um, so that's how I see it. There are other views. Uh, mm-hmm. What what's uh, what's your perspective? Well, you know, I would consider the fact of the wor- world being created in the water and out of the water, if you will, like you had originally mentioned. You know, in Genesis one two, and the Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the earth, and and just this yeah. formless, you know blob you know stuff like <laughs> like what you're saying I, I i would uh hold to that but i like the flood aspect too because contextually he peter does tie in the flood and the scoffers and they're scoffing at two particular topics uh the creation and the flood and so i can definitely see how it could be in reference to the flood as well so uh but yeah i would just These are hold the fun to... theological topics Huh? We, we we both agree that the the Earth was this formless void blob, right? In the creation, we both agree in a in a, uh, a global flood, right? So then we're getting into this co- conversation now, right? Okay, <laughs> which one is Peter talking about? Uh, if we disagree on which one Peter is talking about, we're still agreeing that both events occurred. And totally, totally. Oh my goodness, I got into this huge argument with one of my seminary professors. Yeah, over Ephesians two one. Okay, and we we both believed in these two doctrines, and we were arguing over which doctrine Ephesians oh. two one contributes to. And I was like, "Come on, man, we agree. Why are we? Why are we? Uh, what, what what is this argument? You know, it was, <laughs> no, I I can understand. Same thing here. It's uh, I, yeah. I so Second Peter three five talked about that. What about Genesis four fourteen when Cain is expelled? You know, and he's uh, identified as a vagabond. It, it, there's this aspect he he's afraid of people when he is expelled who are these people that cain is afraid of some people posit these are like a pre-adamic uh <clears throat> species maybe where neanderthal you know came from who, who are these people from a a young earth perspective let's see so uh i would agree that there were pre-adamic races right okay adam was created on day six the birds and the fish were created on day five. Mm. So every bird okay. and a fish is a pre-Adamic race, right? It's not the, they didn't evolve into Adam, right? Right. But I don't think that, uh, that, that Cain was scared of birds and fish coming after him. I think he was scared of, of people, right? Yeah. I don't think he was scared of uh, gorillas coming after him. Gorillas mm-hmm. were created on day six. Mm-hmm. He wasn't scared of dogs and cats coming after him. They were also day six. Yeah, he didn't uh, evolve from something. God created Adam out of dust. I don't think that Cain was scared of dust. So, uh, what is uh, what are our only other options then? I think it was he was scared of other humans. Well, mm-hmm. being as how Adam and Eve are the uh, the parents of Cain, and they were the only ones in the Garden of Eden, I think we can conclude that Cain would have been afraid of other brothers and sisters. Mm-hmm. As well as uh, nieces and nephews, right? Oh, yeah. Um, sons and daughters, right? They will all would have been family at the time. Mm-hmm. And people get grossed out by this. Uh, yeah. But I think that the alternative is even worse, right? So I had this uh, a friend come up to me and say, okay, so you believe in Adam and Eve being the mothers and fathers of everybody. That means, oh, my goodness, you believe someone had to have sexual relationship with his sister Mm -hmm. icky right like okay let's talk about the alternative right Mm -hmm. if we believe in evolution uh and i had a uh a theistic evolutionist actually come out and say this on a blog post and i appreciate his honesty okay yeah he said that the uh early humans would have had to have sexual relationships with non-humans okay so you willingly admit that man had sex with animals, and you're taking this view in order to evade the possibility of man having sex with a sister. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. You got problems. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I say you, I, I mean, they, they, well, they, yeah, yeah, they've yeah. got serious problems, right? So, um, I think that's in the, uh, the early days here, there were plenty of, uh, um, of reproduction going on. It names Cain and Abel specifically, but mm -hmm. we know that they had other sons and daughters as well. Mm -hmm. Um, so there, there's no problem whatsoever with Cain having several other humans around him mm -hmm. who would have known, okay, not only, Cain, did you kill your brother, but mm -hmm. being as how I am your brother too, it was my brother that you killed. No, oh, yeah. That's going to be pretty uh, a pretty uh, stigmatic thing to have, right? <laughs> yeah. People going people gonna to hold that against you. Cain knows this, right? Yeah. So no problem whatsoever for the young earth creationist. You know, one thing I appreciate about your explanation in that is a lot of times within apologetics, uh, we get so concerned in when people bring an attack or a charge against a view like, you know, OK, you believe that they, you know, had to have sex with siblings. We just want to go ahead and be on the defense and try to argue that case, as opposed to what you did was you looked at alternate views and seen OK, what does the alternate view, what does the opposing view have to argue and really show which one, again, is livable, if you will. Because, yeah, you know, I, I appreciate appreciate that you're not just going on the defense, but you're also going on the offense and having a discussion. Well, what do you believe? How do you think mankind evolved from the the animal kingdom? And so that's fascinating. I, I really like that. So oh, thank you. Some people may be wondering, you know, what this rock is on my desk. And uh, so, yes, this rock, if you will. It was gifted to me by my wife years back. And basically what this is, is this is a cast. This is a, a copy of what's known as the Inca stone. And I know there's debate whether Inca stones, whether they were developed because of a hoax or whether they're genuine. Uh, I believe they're genuine based upon patina and other aspects of the rocks that were found in the fact that the rocks were found big, small, all sorts of sizes and just a whole lot to it. I encourage you to look into it plus the type of rocks they were. Uh, but anyways, what this does is this shows a picture. And what you see on this picture is here, you, it looks like you have this type of hunter guy, and here you have a spear. And over here, <coughs> if I were to ask, what does this look like? This looks like a dinosaur. And so what the Inca stones really show and reveal is some way in ancient history, there appears to be carvings, paintings that reveal that man and dinosaur once lived. And that's what the Inca stone, that's one case for that argument. There's a lot more. So I ask you, Paul, is there any other evidence that man and dinosaurs live together? I'm not talking about the crocodiles and the iguanas that we would classify as dinosaurs, but as far as like sauropods and things like that. Is there any evidence that you know of to go ahead and cooperate and support man and dinosaurs living together? Absolutely. You just showed a good one, right? Okay. And the Incas are not the only ones doing this. You, you can go throughout all sorts of ancient cultures, and they've got all sorts of dinosaurs being drawn, described in literature, right? Um, biblically, I don't draw a distinction, really. Between the uh, the T Rex, which is my favorite dinosaur, you can call me basic <laughs> if you want, but I love my T Rex, and the iguana. Right? They're mm -hmm. both day six creation. They are different kinds, mm -hmm. but it's not that the dino the T Rex lived before the iguana. It's that the iguana has outlasted the T Rex. Mm. Um, we we get descriptions in literature. I'll read a, a snippet. Mm -hmm. From the book of Job. Okay. Yeah. Let's pretend like Job is not the Bible. Let's pretend like it was just written by a madman. We could pretend like it wasn't inspired by God all we want. Okay. And we're still going to end up with something interesting here. Right. Let's see. So Job 40, 15. Now look at the behemoth, which I made along with you. Of course, that's a reference to the, the day six creation. But we'll pretend that's wrong. We'll pretend that God doesn't exist. See now. His strength is in his hips, and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. 
The sinews of his th thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs like bars of iron. Um, I'll stop there. So this was actually an argument that someone brought up to me that, that convinced me of Younger's creationism when I rejected the, uh, the, author the authority of Job. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Job is describing a dinosaur, <laughs> right? Big right. cedar tail. It's funny, the, the, the word uh, begimot in, in Russian comes from this word behemoth, huh. and that's the word for hippopotamus. People try to say, oh, it's a hippopotamus. I'm like, does a hippopotamus move his tail like a cedar, or does it move more like a little rope? Yeah, there you go. That's why I have Where's some his cedar tail, toys. right? <laughs> he doesn't have a cedar tail. He's got a little uh, wimpy, uh, I don't know, how would you describe that kind of a hippo tail? Not like a cedar, it'd be like a grapevine. There Very short and stubby. Short not, and stubby, right? Not cedar tree-ish. Um, you could try to say that the alligator, okay, there's something with a big cedar kind of tail, but does he have bones like beams of brahm? His ribs are like bars of iron? No, that's that's the soft spot in the crocodile, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I love watching uh, crocodile wrestler videos on, on TikTok mm -hmm. and whatnot. They always go for the mouth, you know, and then they, they, they move around and whatnot. And the, the ribs are always kind of a soft spot on a crocodile, right? That's true. Or an alligator. I, I'm, I'm going to leave it to the experts to actually fight these things. They make <laughs> it look easy. I know it's not. But this isn't describing one of those. It's not describing anything that uh, that I've ever seen in any zoo. It's not a beast that's just uh, wandering around the, uh, mm -hmm. the wastelands of Oklahoma. No, this is... Uh, this is a dinosaurs uh, akin to the brontosaurus, right? So even if the Bible wasn't authoritative, this is a text of a man describing something that he could see, right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, this is the Bible, yeah. which only adds another layer of uh, of complexity to it, right? Because now it's God describing Behemoth, this dinosaur figure, whom, and he's telling Job, "Look, look, there he is. He's standing mm -hmm. right there with you. Look at him. <laughs> I created this guy with." With you, humans, mm -hmm. right? Not this particular dinosaur with you individually, but right. his grandfather and Adam were created on day six. I was there. You weren't right. in the context of Job. It's like, sit down and shut up, you little punk, right? <laughs> yeah. So we see this in biblical literature. We see this in uh, art from Incas elsewhere. Uh, we see it in other literature. Who was it? I think uh, Marco Polo was describing the 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 dragon handlers in mm -hmm. uh yep in oh, china i think china? it was mm -hmm. yeah in the travel now the word dragon is uh we we think of dragons as these beasts that fly around spitting out fire and whatnot the greek word is dracon which just means big reptile so a uh an alligator would be a dracon t-rex would be a dracon mm -hmm. so in china in marco polo's days there were dracons there were big lizards that were being kept so Mm -hmm. All sorts of reasons to accept that man and dinosaurs live together at the same time. No problem with that. <laughs> you see, and and as I was sort of showing, the reason why I have toys up here, well, one of the reasons is because uh, the kids up at my office at church, they love playing with the toys. And so they immediately go to the toys, toys but there's a purpose. Because another one, another animal that they try to equate the behemoth with is this guy. And again, would we say that his tail was like the tail of a cedar tree? You know, that's that's got... another wimpy tail right there. Yeah, that's I call point. it a wimpy tail. I don't even have a tail, and I can call that a wimpy tail. I'm telling you, that's not a cedar tail. <laughs> oh, we could get into the cockix too, but we're not gonna. <laughs> but and so you're right. I'm I'm glad the fact that you brought this out because even with you know the only ones that really match are the sauropods, and then there when you is. get into history with some tribes over in Africa and other places. There's legends of what's called the Mikili Bembe, which the locals yeah. actually describe a sauropod type dinosaur that they've had to hunt yep. for years. And so, but that's fascinating. That it, doesn't it, align with the, uh, the narrative that these were completely unknown by humans from exactly. the time humans evolved until they discovered them in the 1800s. That doesn't work. Yep. You're totally right. And when you get to ancient carvings, old uh, cave paintings, 
one of the things in Mexico they find are clay figurines that are clearly in shape of different dinosaurs. And when they do some, I there think it's go. called thermo thermoluminescence dating to see how old <laughs> the clay is and how old it was heated up and things like that, they find it's not 70 billion years old and it's not new that it aligns with a biblical timeline. And so there's plenty of yeah, evidences. Absolutely. And so now it's making the naturalists rethink the process of fossilization, you know, and getting into all that. But uh, definitely uh, fossils are on our team. Yes, they are. We believe yes. in a global flood. That explains the, the bulk of fossils right there. Yep. Right? Yep. The fact that marine fossils are found on top of mountaintops and the fact that clams die, oh, yeah. uh, fossilized closed as opposed to open. When they die, they open themselves up. And so you're totally right. There's a whole lot of evidence. What one line we of reason? Uh, water lilies that live mm -hmm. like 200 meters below water, mm -hmm. uh, below sea level. And we have fossils of them on Mount Everest. Yep. <laughs> and so there, there's not yeah. a natural naturalistic explanation on why that's the case. And so, mm -hmm. but there is one theory or hypothesis that naturalists do posit that, I'm curious to get your thoughts. Uh, people may have seen a concept, a drawing, a uh, rendering of what's known as Pangea. Could you elaborate what Pangea is and, and what are your thoughts? Do you think that fits with the biblical narrative as well? Sure. So uh, <clears throat> today we can observe that there are tectonic plates that, all, that we're all sitting on. And right. these tectonic plates are shifting around. And you can uh, measure the the speed at which they're moving. So it's often been observed that if you look at South America and Africa, they mm -hmm. look like two puzzle pieces that could fit together really nicely. Right. Um, they're drifting apart. If I recall correctly, South America is drifting away at about the rate that your fingernails are growing. Oh, okay. So however much your fingernail would grow in a year, that's how far the... Uh, South America would drift over the hmm. course of the past year. And you can uh, take that current rate and uh, uh, calculate how long it would take then at this current rate for Africa and South America to be together. Mm -hmm. And it would be over uh, 10,000 years old. So ha ha ha, you silly biblicist. <laughs> Don't you see you're wrong? God doesn't exist. Well, there are plenty of uh, reasons to... Uh, Say, no, 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 God can exist and we can still have a South America that's shifting at the rate of a finger now. Yeah. Um, one way is, so in the uh, Table of Nations there in Genesis 11, we have a reference, no, Genesis 10. 10, yep. We have a reference to uh, Peleg, and in his days, the, uh, the world was separated. Mm -hmm. Some would say that this would be an occurrence after the uh, the global flood we had Pangea, all of the continents together, and then in his days, the tectonic shifts place shifted, mm -hmm. and so all of the continents moved around. Right. And this could be an explanation for how it is that the uh, kangaroo managed to get onto Australia, or how we have certain birds and whatnot in uh, South America that walk. Um, that's one way. I would tend to to, to disagree with that view on, mm -hmm. on the grounds that... Um, if we had that drastic of a shift in one lifetime, it would probably be strong enough to destroy all life on earth. Okay. Um, but a lot of people would say that it did happen in that day. That, that's fine. Mm -hmm. uh, my approach to the tectonic place is a little bit different. I'd say that during the pre-flood world, it was all together in a Pangea. We had rivers. So there was water going through land but mm -hmm. we didn't have these vast oceans like we do today. Mm -hmm. During the course of the flood, uh, the Bible describes it as events like the the fountains of the deep opening up. So mm -hmm. I think that would involve like very deep volcanic activity blowing forth. And right. uh, so we have water coming from below, water coming from above. The whole earth is covered in water. And while Noah and his family are safely on the water, a lot of stuff is going on underneath, mm -hmm. and during that time, the plates shifted, mm -hmm. and then the water comes back down, mountains go up, and we end up with the continents 
more or less where they are today, and they've been shifting ever slowly ever since. Okay. So um, both approaches, be it in the days of Peleg or during the flood, would say that there was a quick shift, and then things have been moving slowly ever since. That's the key, right? That yeah. the the slow movement that we're observing today hasn't been the constant rate for all of eternity. Mm -hmm. There was a period of a quick change, and then things have slowly been moving ever since. So we can't look at the fingernail rate today and extend it all the way back. We can extend it 4,000 years back, but then we got to say there was a big change right around mm -hmm. there. So, so, you know, I like the fact that you brought up that last comment because the naturalist would posit a form of uniformitarianism that uh, the present is key to the past. That as the rates are moving today, like you said, with the rate of your fingernail, such was the case ever since the formation of the universe. And that's making a very, very bad assumption, you know, and there's very a lot bad, of ways to bad. argue against that view, especially when you look at tree rings and tree rings are formed. It depends on whether there's droughts, there's heavy rain, monsoon, stuff like that. But, you know, I would... Definitely agree with you uh, as far as the timing of the flood is when a lot of this ha is when this happened. And yeah, kangaroos and walking birds, they're, they're not a problem with biblical creationists. They actually clearly argue what happened and how that's possible. So, oh, kangaroos are my favorite. Why? We actually, so we're talking about um, drawings of, of dinosaurs. There are yeah. also drawings of kangaroos in like, uh, India, that area. So the, the atheist narrative is that kangaroos uh, evolved on their own on Australia. They never naturally lived anywhere else until zoos came along and kidnapped them. But here we have evidence of kangaroos living on the land on their way to Australia, which yeah. is the biblical, uh, the, the biblically supported, right? We have the flood. Yep. Kangaroos managed to jump their way down to Australia. So there's transitional kangaroo yeah. between... Ararat in Australia, exactly what you would expect. No, yeah, I would agree with you on that. I, I think what they'll argue is a land bridge that once was that no longer is. But again, they're they're positing assumptions and, and hypotheses within that to fit their their theology, if you will. But so the flood was that localized in Mesopotamia, or was the flood a global in? If you one way or the other, why do you believe that? What argument is there for it? Let's uh, let's take a look at the the biblical text here. Yeah. So now the flood was on the earth forty days. The water increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. Okay, that can work with a local flood or a global flood. Mm -hmm. The waters prevailed greatly, increased on the earth, and the ark was moved about on the surface of the waters. Mm -hmm. Okay, that can go either way too. Uh, Genesis 7, 19. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. That's where it starts to go global, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you're able to have a uh, system where all of the high hills under the whole of heaven were covered, but you still have some land poking out I'd like to hear it. <laughs> no, you cover all the high hills, you've covered all the land. Um, and all the flesh died. Uh, oh, here we go. And the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. Okay. So if you can cover the mountains, mm -hmm. you can have 15 cubits above the mountain, the, the mountains covered in water, and still have a valley that's uncovered. I'd like to hear how you do it. Yeah, yeah. All the flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man, all in whose life's nostril, the breath of, of the spirit of life, and all on the dry, dry land died. So a uh, response to this that I've heard is, oh, well, uh, this word earth, arets, mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, is where we get the uh, the English word earth. Okay. Um, we do a lispy th at the end instead of a ts, but uh, yeah, Eretz is the, the the basis of Earth, the planet. It can be used to describe land, um, and uh, 
I had an old earth uh, uh, evolution, theistic evolutionist mm -hmm. try to, to to sell me on this, and I was hearing him out. And uh, nice guy, he's mm -hmm. uh, actually made some very uh, good contributions to the scientific world. He was on a team that helped discover the uh, Higgs boson particles, for example. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, interesting that we have theists doing that kind of work, but uh, he wasn't a young earther. And yeah. his his exegetical response was that it can mean land. Mm -hmm. um, and if you do a study of uh, this word Eretz throughout the uh, the Bible, whenever you have kol ha Eretz, mm -hmm. right, all of the land or all of the earth, um, whenever it's all of the land, it will typically have a, a word behind it, right? Okay. All of the land of uh, Babylon, all of the land of Sumer, and so yeah. on and so forth, right? Uh -huh. However, it doesn't have that modifier, right? Uh, so the, that's the way that uh, the Hebrew will work. It sort of connects a whole bunch of words. It doesn't have okay. like uh, of that we have. It doesn't do the possessives quite like we do. Mm -hmm. But in order for this to be the land... You would need it to be like the land of what? Mm. You got to tell me the specific land that you're talking about. Otherwise, all of the land is going to mean all of the earth. It's the entire planet. Okay. It's uh, it's bad Hebrew to try to restrict all of the earth here to a particular land without a Hebrew um barrier, some kind of a constriction there in the text to tell me mm -hmm. that it's restricted to a particular land. Right. So that is not just the highest mountain on a particular Mesopotamian plateau. Mm -hmm. It's all of the earth. And mm -hmm. by the way, if you try to cover the biggest mountain in uh, a local Mesopotamian area, it's going to cover a whole lot more <laughs> than Mesopotamia. I would love to see the uh yeah. the mountains that are being covered according to the uh the uh the, the local flood view mm -hmm. now one thing that they'll try to bounce back with is they'll say well this word for covering doesn't really mean cover it means just to come up and brush upon mm. so the idea is there's a big mountain and the waters came up and just touched the mountain mm. uh, someone posted me that that so I looked up the word really quickly I'm expecting some kind of like a kippur root for cover, and it's not that. So I'm like, hmm. oh, okay, well, that's interesting. I'll look into it. Well, I did a further study on it, and this is a word that's used for uh, for like clouds <laughs> covering okay. the earth, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it's clearly, a, it's a giant covering. Uh, it, it's in the Hebrew text. It's very clear. This is describing a global flood. It's not local to mm -hmm. Mesopotamia or anywhere else. Huh. Fascinating. So... When we're when we're looking at this, the naturalists will argue that one of the knocks against the young Earth creationism is the time period known as the Ice Age. So, if the flood of Noah's days was global, where does the Ice Age fit? The woolly mammoth, and how could man survive tens of thousands of years of an Ice Age of cold weather drastically changing? Uh, what are your thoughts? This is a good question. Um, so let's bounce over to another uh, another controversy. Okay. Nuclear war. Right? <laughs> okay. What does nuclear <laughs> war have to do with mammoths? <laughs> so um, one of the, the things you'll hear is nuclear winter, right? We're scared oh, that yeah. if uh, we start throwing nuclear bombs all over the place, it's going to turn the, the planet into a, a winter. It's going to cause cooling. Well, mm -hmm. Uh, that's weird because nuclear bombs are, uh, I've never been around one, but I hear they're very hot, right? <laughs> so how is it that a nuclear bomb could cause cooling? Well, we, we, we extract that from some uh, observations that we've seen. Well, first of all, whenever people do tests of the bombs and whatnot, but also uh, volcanoes mm -hmm. have uh, been known to blast stuff up in the air and cause shadows and whatnot and cause cooling. In fact, okay. I think it was in the 1200s, we had a big volcano um, down in uh, near Indonesia, if I'm not mistaken, okay. that caused a little ice age that lasted for a couple of centuries, right? Just one oh. big volcano did that. Wow, yeah. <clears throat> so it happens that 
catastrophes like volcanoes and nukes. I don't think nukes were really going on back in the the flood. Right. But these are things that can cause cooling. So Mm -hmm. we go back to the flood and it's describing the the fountains of the deep opening up. So it's a lot of uh, catastrophic events that are uh, involving not just rain coming down and hitting the earth, but the earth Mm -hmm. itself blowing up and blowing, spewing all sorts of volcanic ash and soot all over the place. That could very well cause Mm -hmm. a a huge ice age. I mean, if one volcano is enough to set you back several degrees, just imagine if the whole earth is blowing up volcanoes everywhere Mm -hmm. over the course of a year. Okay. So assuming that's what's happening, then whenever Noah gets off of the ark, what's the world going to be like? It's going to be very cold, right? Right. So very well could be that the ice age, um, the big one, was set off by the flood so that whenever Noah left the ark, there was an ice age. This would imply several things. Um, First of all, so uh, we're concerned about global warming today. One Mm -hmm. of the reasons is because it will cause the uh, polar caps polar caps to melt, Mm -hmm. which would rise the water levels, Mm -hmm. which would flood out all of your big cities along the the coast. Well, the opposite is also true, right? If you have a lot more ice, that would mean that the water levels are lower. Mm. So more ice, ice age, lowers the water, which means that we now have land bridges in areas Mm. that are currently covered in water because of the melting of the caps. Right. It would also imply that we could have um, ice bridges over the bodies of water, the water that still existed, right? Right. And so now we have the uh, the kangaroo, right? Going back to him, yeah. Uh, he's able to jump from the the <laughs> ark over the course of a couple of generations down to Australia, where he's yeah. able to thrive. And then he gets cut off by the rising waters again, right? So that could dis- uh, explain a lot of that uh, human migration. Could, mm-hmm. could work out too, right? So the descendants of Noah, some of them after the dispersion at Babel would go up through China mm-hmm. into Alaska, down through Canada, down to the current United States, Mexico, into South America. Yeah. And there's been some interesting studies to promote, uh, to advocate man coming from South America to Indonesia on the water. So the Ice Age... Uh, I think we can explain through the flood, and it would help resolve a lot of the problems that people are trying to resolve through evolution, right? Mm-hmm. There's no need to say that animals evolved independently in these different localities just mm-hmm. because we don't have a bridge there right now. If right. we had a recent ice age from a recent flood, then a lot of animals could have moseyed on over no yeah. problem. Mm-hmm. So... The Ice Age, you know, and equating it to nuclear fallout and ash covering uh, the sky, if you will, and having a cooling effect. And then the aspect of, you know, the land bridge. I like the concept and, and you know, the concern with the polar ca- ice caps melting and rising the sea level. And like you said, opposite would be true as well. If everything freezes, your sea yep. level lowers. And so I never thought about that either. In fact, that that would clearly articulate part of how, how did the waters, you know, you know, evaporate, if you will, and recede. And so awesome. I, I really appreciate that. He, here's an interesting one. And with this, I think we have like one or two left and then we'll, we'll let you go. There's been a lot of discussion with UFOs in the recent years and a lot of looking at is there intelligent life out there? <laughs> SETI has been going on for decades. And I, I don't want to talk about if we find life uh, on Mars, in, in fact, of bacteria or whatever the case. I want to talk about intelligent life, you know, that has free will, that has emotion, that has intellect, things that would make something have the characteristics of personhood. Uh, do you believe there's possibly intelligent life out there Somewhere in the universe, why or why not? So, um, biblically speaking, mm-hmm. the Bible does not say that there are uh, other um, created kinds that live on other planets. Mm-hmm. Um, 
nor does the Bible say that God did not create uh, other created kinds on other planets. Right. So the Bible is silent on the issue. I would find it very unlikely, though. Mm-hmm. Um, the Bible does talk about angels and fallen angels and right. angelic conflict. So when we get to the discussion of um, of uh, intelligent life elsewhere, yeah. Uh, really even even life elsewhere is mm-hmm. if if we could I want them to discover life on Mars. I do <laughs> because it would destroy as if we haven't destroyed evolutionism enough. Uh-huh. Right. The, the 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 sheer improbability of, of life coming from non-life and all this and all that. Yeah. If we could just find a single protein on Mars, now everything and all of the unlikelihood and improbability of occurring on Earth. Mm-hmm. Now has to happen again yeah, <laughs> in the right. same solar system. Right. And that would just destroy it. I, I don't uh, it's I say it would destroy it as if there hasn't been enough destruction to, right. to eat the as if we <laughs> needed more, right? But I would just giggle so hard if we found non-intelligent life somewhere else. But intelligent life, legitimate intelligent life, that would uh, that would just that would I would I would it would be a knee slapper so hard. I would I would go into like asthmatic shock from laughing too hard uh-huh. uh, if, if that was to occur because it would just be such a blow to atheism, right? If we find more intelligent life out there, it's mm-hmm. it's it's going to be more and more and more support of intelligent design. Hmm. That's mm-hmm. my perspective on finding other intelligent life. Uh, that said, mm-hmm. I don't think that there is um, legitimate um life out there um, if you come across a uh, ufo if a ufo lands in your backyard and an alien pops out right right if i was to see something like that which i never have mm-hmm. i would be more inclined to believe that this is not a another uh, animal that god has created uh, i would be more inclined to say that this is probably a demon okay uh, a fallen angel who is here to confuse me. As such, having an appropriate uh, understanding that the demons are the, the bad guys, that we don't want to befriend the fallen angels, mm-hmm. I would have uh, nothing to do with him. I would uh, get away from him, not try to establish any kind of contact, um, just because I don't trust demons. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I, I don't either. I do remember... We were living in Maryland at the time. I don't know. I was probably like 14 years old, something like that. And it was nighttime and we had a balcony, uh, you know, outside, the, obviously the second floor. And I'm out there, I'm talking on the phone. And to this day, I can still remember seeing it. I remember seeing like a green dot in the night sky. And then all of a sudden the dot moved down. Uh, it went sideways. Then it sort of went in a circular motion and then it disappeared like that. And, you know, I could never explain, you know, hey, shooting star, falling <laughs> star. I couldn't explain it being an aircraft with its movement side to side, circular and zipping off like that. And I only told a couple people about it. But uh, it's interesting, my childhood, that there seemed to be a lot of pull to the to the occultic world from other forces you know in, in my life and and looking back i could see that was a one of the pivotal moments in my life to consider okay i don't believe that was extraterrestrial or intelligent life aliens per se i believe that was some sort of spiritual working in my life because when i look back at everything else that had transpired of uh growing up just in experiences i personally had I could see there was a pull uh, from what I would articulate from some sort of devil into the occultic world that I was thankful that I was able to resist and and not get into. And maybe one day I'll do a video as far as what all that looked like and what all happened. But I do remember there's a ser- season in my life that it was quite intriguing. But uh, looking back, like I said, looking at everything, I do believe that that was a spiritual battle, spiritual attack. And trying to pull me away because possibly they, number one, they don't want to keep 
uh, a child of God within the, you know, within good graces with God. So they're yep. trying to pull them away or they don't want an unbeliever to get to know the true God. And it's interesting when you look at uh, abductions of the fourth or uh, uh, not abductions, but uh, close encounters of the fourth kind when it's the aspect of like abduction, because you have different kinds, first, second, third, fourth kind. And then the fourth is like actually being abducted. And then you have messages, communication. There's a lot of universalism or atheistic messages that seem to be given uh, by people that claim that they've been abducted or a third kind had some sort of communication with them. So when you look at that as well, and you look at what message they're saying about God or religion and spirituality as a whole, it totally doesn't align with scripture. And it's, it's interesting when you consider that. Well, last question sort of ties into this uh, previous question. Yeah. You mentioned, you know, it's your your belief that there is not any intelligent life. Now, I like what you said, that the Bible doesn't say that there was other life created elsewhere or there was not. Do you believe if intelligent life was discovered elsewhere, if an alien dropped down in your backyard, a gray, a green, a Nordic, whatever, and they, you were like, oh, this is real. This isn't <coughs> devilish. This is real. Would it have any bearing or weight as opposed to scripture, the Bible, Christianity, Jesus, salvation? What are your thoughts on that? If intelligent life was proven to be real, uh, would that disprove Christianity? What are your thoughts? <clears throat> and I hope you're okay. You, you need some water? Oh, I'm good. Uh, okay. Drink a coffee to keep my uh, my whistle wet, but I ran out. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is an exciting thing to talk about. Thanks again for for having mm -hmm. me here. Uh, always happy to destroy my throat to talk about creationism. <laughs> so, um, we should probably qualify what we mean by intelligent life. Um, is a uh, a dog, for example. An intelligent life okay or are you talking like uh something on the level as human or we're talking what, what yeah, exactly let, would the challenge be to to the biblical worldview yeah let, let, let's look at it let, let's omit the dog aspect because yeah dog does okay. have personhood volition emotion intellect yeah. let's talk about what hollywood portrays as the extraterrestrial that looks like us in a similar fashion and uh, they can fly vehicles and, and travel light years and different galaxies. Let's talk about that. Okay. I would automatically assume that it's demonic. Why? Um, the Bible doesn't say that there is other stuff out there. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't say that there is not other stuff okay. out there. Right. Um, it does say that there are angelic beings out there. Mm -hmm. So the 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 one thing that the Bible does confirm is uh, more likely to be the reality than something that the Bible does not confirm or deny, right? Mm. The So if we have a uh, an intelligent being on on our level, mm -hmm. uh, that would imply, let's see, what would that imply that God is creating something, in the case of what we're seeing in Hollywood, they're they're more mm -hmm. intelligent than us. He's so he's mm -hmm. making something that's more intelligent than us somewhere else. However, whenever we look around here on Earth, we are the most intelligent thing on Earth. Right. So, if God wanted to have a uh, anthropocentric world, right, where man is in charge of Earth, okay, it would make sense for ma God to give man the the highest abilities here. Mm -hmm. So, I, I on that ground, I would kind of kind of find it unlikely that if God did create other kinds somewhere else, that those kinds would be more intelligent than us. Okay. So that's another reason I would, I would find that doubtable. Right. Um, there's also what you mentioned earlier about what we're hearing from the, uh, the alleged um, abductions and encounters, right? The actual right. communication that's going back and forth. Um, as a, a minimum, I think that, uh, Regardless of where you stand on the UFO controversies, I mm -hmm. think everyone would recognize that there's a lot of uh, fabrications going on out there, right? Right. Whether or not UFOs exist, there are people who are claiming to have seen UFOs that are not seeing UFOs. Right. So we can't really take the 
encounters on the same authority as scripture. However, right. if we do look at what they're saying, like you said, they're carrying messages that are contrary to the word of God. Mm-hmm. So assuming it's an angelic being and assuming that it's coming from a, a perspective that is contrary to the word of God, we're left with fallen angels. Mm-hmm. Um it's also for, for particularly interesting to me this uh, that I remember especially in 2020, right when we're all shut down, everything's going crazy. Mm-hmm. People are watching Tiger King on Netflix, <laughs> and all of a sudden we get this talk about UFOs, and everyone just kind of accepts it like it's normal. Right. Like, well, that's interesting. Uh, in decades past, people would have instantly been suspect. Now they're being more accepting of of UFOs. Right. Um, this is also characteristic of uh, my understanding of demons. We know that they have a sort of a hierarchy. Um, mm-hmm. In Daniel, we see uh, Michael wrestling with the prince of Persia, which I understand mm-hmm. to be the de- demon who was over Persia at the time. Mm-hmm. So it seems like there's a particular connection between the worldly governments and the demonic realm. Right. So – that all of a sudden we have um, the the worldly governments being accepting and open about UFOs all of a sudden, mm-hmm. assuming that UFOs are legitimate, would lend to the the possibility that they are indeed demonic, um, which I'm still suspicious very much of a, of a lot of the stuff going on out there. Yeah. So the existence of demons is not at all a challenge to the biblical worldview right mm. the bible is talking about them through and through <laughs> so if a uh, ufo happens to land in my backyard and mm-hmm. little green man comes out starts talking to me i don't care what he says against the bible he's only supporting it assuming he is a demon because that's what demons right. do is they they attack the bible yeah um I guess if he was a really sneaky demon, then he would try to come and tell me something uh, in support of the Bible and then try to get me to question it a little bit, right? That's mm-hmm. uh, that's kind of a, a sneaky move too, right? Get me to question <laughs> the question God. That That's how he got Eve, right? Yeah. I can't be that much smarter than she was. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I wouldn't say that any of the, the business going on with UFOs, if it's entirely fabricated, then it's no challenge to anything because it's false. Mm-hmm. If it's entirely true... It's no challenge to the Bible because it's demonic. There's no reason for intelligent life anywhere else to be any kind of threat to uh, to biblicism. Okay, excellent. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, so today we covered everything from creationism to the age of the earth and the universe, uh, different theories as far as uh, what people believe as far as origins. Talked about the flood. We talked about the ice age. We even talked about aliens, and and you got to see a hippopotamus today. And there so this go. has been a pretty interesting and exciting <laughs> interview. Uh, before we close, uh, Paul, is there any final words, any parting shots you want to give to the people here watching still, and uh, anything you want to button up before we say goodbye? Um, Just to reiterate what we said at the very beginning, right? This stuff is very important in the realm of discipleship, in the realm of sanctification, in the realm of growing to have a holistic worldview. But you don't have to accept a young earth creationism or any of this other stuff we've been talking about to be saved. That is all about believing in Jesus for eternal life. Regardless of how old the universe is, Jesus died for your sins, and he offers eternal life to anyone who simply believes in him for it. Amen. Amen. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Dr. Miles. And uh, that's it for today. Be on the lookout for other interviews coming up, different topics, different speakers, things like that. Like, comment, share, subscribe. You know what to do. And until next time, God bless.